Hi, my name is Deborah Grayson Wallace. I am a member of the Peace Action Main Board and I am a former lobbyist on the federal budget with the Friends Committee on National Legislation. They are a Quaker lobby in the public interest, which means that they lobby with an eye to um, improving life in the United States for all residents, but actually really for the whole world as well, because they do take a strong moral stance on foreign policy issues. When I um, was first learning very um, thoroughly about the federal budget, I was learning it under that moral lens of the federal budget is a moral document. It reflects our values and what we prioritize as a nation, uh, something that is sort of a theme throughout my slideshow. And it is on moral grounds alone that they believe we should not be funding the um, militaristic approach that we take as a country to the level that we are, especially at the cost of investing in our communities in other ways. Who am I? What do I know? What do I not know? And what's my perspective? Well, I'm not an expert per se in budgets. I'm not an accountant and I'm not part of the federal government. But I do know how to interpret the federal budgets. I know how the process works. And I'm familiar with lobbying both as a professional and as a citizen lobbyist for the last four years or so, um, since I was a professional. I tend to approach the federal budget from a values-based perspective, and I believe that it is a direct reflection of our priorities as a nation. I'm a sociologist by training, as I said, not an accountant, but I do think that that lens helps me interpret the priorities and how funding influences policy. Um, okay, so why? Why are we here right now? Why am I even talking about the federal budget today? And that is because yesterday was tax day and uh, we are have organized this event as part of the Global Day of Action Against Military Spending. Um, this is a infographic from the GDAMS, the Global Day of Action on Military Spending Campaign and it depicts uh, how much each country spends on their military. And this is in 2018 dollars, I believe. It says it's somewhere on there, but it's too blurry for me to make out. Um, so this isn't projected, this is actual, but it's a little bit retrospective because the budgets are always a year or so behind because the actual outlays never quite reflect what the expected number was. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Anyway, but as you can see, the United States spends a lot more than any other country. Um, in fact, it spends more than like seven to 10, depending on whose figures you're using, of these countries combined. But this is an easy way to look at how much more of our resources we spend than any other country. Well, that's the overall global picture. And this is the individual United States tax dollar picture. So this is an infographic from the National Priorities Project. And every one of these resources that I'm going to be referring to uses slightly different ways of looking at the budget, which is part of what makes this conversation so frustrating and confounding. Because people, particularly I would like to say from the other ideological side of the perspective, people who believe that we should be, if anything, increasing how much money we spend on making war, um, like to use those budget mechanics and different ways of looking at it to argue that we're actually spending less than ever before, which really is completely false when it comes to real term dollars. But even more than that, I think that's largely beside the point. Because from my perspective, what really matters is that how much money we're spending in real terms and the amount of our budget that we have the discretion to distribute out to different types of priorities. For every dollar we spend on the military, that's a dollar that we're not spending on anything else. This is just your income tax dollars, and even with including Medicaid and other health funding, uh, excuse me, including Medicaid in with other health funding, because there are pieces of health funding that are discretionary, um, the military still accounts for 24 cents on every dollar. Perhaps I should have put this at the beginning, my apologies. But an authorization is a law that says a certain amount of money can be spent. Um, well, really, all, authorization is a law that says anything can be done, but in terms of the budget, it's what says this amount of money can be spent on this thing. 
appropriations are where the money gets drilled down to the programmatic level, and that's actually where money is allocated out of the federal budget. So an authorization is just permission to spend money, but it needs to come before money can be appropriated, and it's appropriation that's actually distributing money um, to be spent. Uh, the debt is the total amount of money owed by the federal government. The debt has been growing for a long time now and is of concern to a lot of people. The conversation around that gets complicated because some people focus on the debt and others focus on the deficit, whereas the deficit is one, a one-year gap between spending and revenue. So the deficit changes from year to year while the debt has just continued to grow. Revenue is all the money that the government takes in, typically through taxes, although there are a couple other ways that we get revenue as a federal government. Discretionary spending is what I was referring to a minute ago as the spending that Congress has choice about spending. So um, all mandatory spending, which is the other type of spending, is already legally authorized. And in fact, the government is legally bound to spend money on those things, such as Social Security and Medicare. Um, most mandatory spending has its own off-budget federal stream, but some doesn't, and some has had shortfalls that have required it to pull upon um, the other pot of money, which comes from primarily income taxes. The Last two terms I want to clarify are the Overseas Contingency Operations Fund, or OCO account, which was war funding created specifically to support activities in the Afghanistan and Iraq wars. And it is off budget in that it is not part of the regular federal budget. It's money that we're spending, but it's been more or less going on a like off-budget, unaccounted for, as of yet unpaid federal credit card. We haven't been paying back everything we've been spending on overseas contingency operations. And in recent years, an increasing amount of what should be funded under the base budget, like activities that are part of regular maintenance and very clearly not part of war activities, have been funded through the OCO account. And as I'll mention briefly, in Trump's 2020 budget, he proposes drastically increasing this account next year. And it's been, well, never mind. Yeah, basically it, it has been called a slush fund by a number of people. I am not calling it that per se, but it's definitely a um, unique budget tactic used by Congress to give the military more money than um, they write into the official federal budget. And then the conference process, which is when the two chambers of the House uh, have to come together to agree upon a particular version of a bill. In this case, what we'll be talking about, particular versions of budgets, um, because anything that they send to the president to be signed into law has to match. And so while separate budgets will often pass each chamber in order for it to be passed to the president to be signed into law, uh, they have to come to reconciliation, aka they have to agree on all the details within it. Okay, so how the federal budget works ideally is this uh, lengthy process with very specific timing. So um, in the most ideal circumstances, the second Monday of February of every year, the president releases a budget proposal. Six weeks after that president's budget proposal comes out, the congressional committees in each chamber respond with how their own spending priorities differ from the president's. After that, the House and the Senate pass their own budget resolution, which is not all the particulars of the federal budget, but it's the overall spending chunks, how much money they want to give to each of the main functions of government. And then, oh, that's supposed to pass by April 15th out of both um, chambers and be resolved. They're, they're supposed to conference and come to agreement by April 15th of every year. It hasn't happened. This exact process actually has only happened four times since it was originally laid out in law sometime in the 70s. So, 
However, 1870s. <laughs> the 1970s, yeah. <laughs> no, not the 1870s. <laughs> um, but it's gotten increasingly far from this process in recent years. Um, but anyway. Um, and then they have from April to September for the individual appropriations committees to appropriate money. And so what that means is that that budget resolution authorizes the total amount of money that the federal budget is allowed to spend. And then um, each chamber, the House and the Senate, have 12, well, they have one appropriations committee and 12 um, appropriations bills that have to come first out of that appropriations committee and then get passed through their own chamber and ultimately they have to match each other between the House and the Senate. But those appropriations bills are where federal budget funding is drilled down to the specific program level. And that's also where pol real policy changes live. So if the House Appropriations Committee wanted to significantly increase funding under the Violence Against Women Act um, in 2020, and the um, to make that happen and still fit within the Department of Justice top line number given to them by the budget that was just agreed upon, they would have to take that money from somewhere else within the Department of Justice. But it's where they drill down exactly how much money will go to each program, but they're constrained by the overall top line number for each federal agency. Um, so there's 12 different bills governing all those different programs and they're broken up by agency. So the agencies are grouped together. So for example, one appropriations bill is the THUD bill, which is transportation, housing, and urban development. And so all the programs that fall under that, which covers anything from rental assistance to transportation infrastructure investments, um, they all have to be divvied up by the appropriations committee within that overall top line budget figure for that bill laid out by the federal budget resolution. And then after that, um, as I said, all 12 appropriations bills must be agreed upon by both chambers, the House and the Senate, and then they have to be signed into law by the president by October 1st, because if they are not, it causes a government shutdown. And so that's the ideal system. And basically the, um, the president's budget and those uh, budgets laid out by the House and the Senate are where both chambers of Congress and the President are outlining their priorities for the country. And they may include some policy specifications, but the true like outlays of exactly how much is going to be spent in each section are determined by the appropriations. So how it's actually been working, uh, it doesn't look anything like that. As I said, that exact process, which technically is the law, but is not followed, um, <laughs> has uh, not happened very often, even since that process was created. So due to a variety of disagreements about our priorities as a country and what makes the most sense for us, um, these other alternative processes for budgeting have been how our government has spent its money over the last, I don't know, at least decade, but uh, as I pointed out, it often has not followed exactly that process. So really longer than that, but it's been increasingly messy over the last decade. So what they've done instead are a combination of two different types of <laughs> measures instead of going through that whole process where each of the 12 appropriations bills is uh, separately passed and sent to the president. One of those budgetary processes that they've taken instead is called a continuing resolution. Um, and a continuing resolution extends previous funding for existing programs with absolutely no changes. It extends everything as is. So you can't even account for inflation within a continuing resolution unless you specifically attach an amendment to it to change something about current spending levels. It also means that no new programs can be added and it's really, um, everyone accepts and recognizes, everyone within political science and the government, that it's not a good way to budget or to govern because you are not taking that time to talk about your priorities, talk about what is and isn't working among the programs that you're funding as a country. 
but it's one of those things that gets done as a stopgap measure quite a bit. Um, and a continuing resolution or a CR can be as short as one day or in recent years as big as two years. And so that's really a failure of the Congress to do their job of deciding how we should spend our money as a country. Uh, and the other mechanism that has been how our budgets have passed in recent years are omnibuses, which is where instead of passing each uh, appropriations bill separately, a number of appropriation bills, or sometimes all of them, are lumped together, and it has to be one vote. And again, that is highly problematic because it takes out all of the negotiation and give and take that's supposed to happen as part of that lengthier, um, more paced budget process. Um, and then one other thing, one other law complicating this factor um, is the Budget Control Act of 2011. And I mention a law that is almost 10 years old at this point because it is actually still setting um, our budget limits as of out, as far as 2021. So what the Budget Control Act of 2011 grew out of was this very deep concern among Congress about the debt and the deficit. And um, the exact circumstances were that we needed a debt limit increase, debt ceiling increase, or we would default. Um, we as a country would default, which to date we have not done, but would be really bad for our ability to borrow money from other countries. And with a many trillion dollar deficit running that I'll talk about in a minute, that would be completely, that would basically break our federal budget and break our federal government really probably. Um, anyway, and so we were badly in need of a debt ceiling increase. The government would not be able to spend any more money unless they got one. But there were a lot of members of Congress who were very worried about how our debt and their deficit continued to grow. And so what they did is they passed this Budget Control Act law that said um, we could only spend this amount of money on each defense and non-defense spending over the next 10 years. And that's exactly how they said it. Defense spending, non-defense spending. So they took our budget and they broke it into two different priorities. The military and literally everything else. Um, and it was intended to encourage a budget agreement that included tax increases or budget cuts equal to that debt increase. So the whole idea was that, oh, these mandatory limits would be distasteful to Congress. And so we're using this as a mechanism to force people to come to the table and negotiate a true um, budget resolution that includes increased revenues um, or at least cuts to spending so that we can begin to rein in our debt or a deficit. So the whole point was to make more responsible budgeting happen in the future. Um, because if no agreement was reached, it would trigger automatic across the board cuts Indiscriminate. So every single program throughout the entire government would be cut by the exact same amount if they didn't come to this negotiated agreement that was called for in this Budget Control Act. And that is known as sequestration. And it was so feared um, by members of Congress that they thought for sure it would get people to negotiate things and take a responsible view and talk about what we could do as a country to stop increasing our debt continuously. Um, this is a video I'm going to actually try to show. This is an animated historical overview of U.S. budgets that I believe begins in 1960. So it's showing the military and all those other pieces of the budget. So that includes transportation, housing and community development, energy and the environment, health and Medicare, um, and the way that it grew over time. And this is based off of OMB numbers, the Office of Budget and Management, which puts out that retrospective of how much money was actually spent each year. So this is 99, 2000, 2001. You'll really start to see grow as we get into those wars. So we have, in the last, what is that now? Oh well, yeah, in the last decade, we have not been investing in 
much other than the military. And it's not like in 2010 uh, we were investing significantly more than the past. We were actually investing significantly less than we had been in the past in 2010 when we began um, really cutting back on how much we spend on improving our communities or just basic things like rebuilding bridges. Uh, I don't know if you all can see this, but it starts in 1976 with the percent of GDP that was spent on non-defense discretionary spending. So everything that is not either a mandatory program, like Social Security and Medicare, or defense spending. So as I said at the beginning, different people and organizations like to cut up the total budget pie different ways. But no matter how you slice it, defense spending accounts for a huge portion of the pie. So this is a National Priorities Project look at the Trump discretionary budget request for 2019. So this is what was requested, not enacted. Um, but it's really not that much higher than what actually was ultimately enacted. And the, um, hmm, a lot of these things are also related to the cost of war. Like veterans benefits, in my opinion, count as part of the military spending because I think of that as what we spend to make war as a country. That's true. Okay, so that's a historical retrospective, very briefly, on how we've been spending our money as a government for the last good long while, 40 years, 10 years. Um, so where are we now in 2019? We just had a glimpse at the request for this year. Um, every year since the Budget Control Act set those caps, Congress has made adjustments to the budgets in order to raise those spending limits. Um, in 2018, the uh, 2017 tax cut bill, legislative changes that happened last year brought in less tax revenue, particularly from corporations, and also resulted in higher spending. Even though we didn't make um, hugely significant investments in uh, non-defense spending, we did make some. And um, <laughs> what this caused was the deficit rose 77% in the first few months of fiscal year 2019 compared to the same period in, um, oh, I have a typo in here. That's supposed to say fiscal year 2018. So the first few months of this fiscal year, our deficit has risen um, almost twice as much as it did the previous uh, like time of the same year. So um, the first five months of 2019, the deficit grew by 310 billion, whereas in the first five months of 20 fiscal year 18, it had grown 176 billion, and that's per the Treasury Department. So that's according to part of the administration itself, the deficit has grown that much more. Um, even in fiscal year 2017, individuals are paying $7 in taxes for every dollar paid by corporations. So, and that's also where the bulk of the tax cuts came from, was corporations are paying much less due to the tax changes that um, President Trump passed last year. Corporate tax payments fell close to 25% because the 2017 uh, tax law lowered the corporate tax rate from 35% to 21%. And as was just pointed out, a lot of major corporations don't pay anything at all in taxes. Even though those of us with uh, nonprofit jobs pay lots of money in taxes. So it's a little confusing to me. It certainly does not reflect my priorities, but I guess that's why I'm here talking to you about it. <laughs> um, so where else are we on tax day? So President Trump proposed a 2020 budget in March, so only a month late, not too bad. Um, in the House, Democrats passed a bill out of the budget committee that was not an actual budget resolution, but it was spending caps for the two pieces of the budget, the defense and the non-defense. However, after they passed it out of the budget committee, um, a num two different factions within the Democratic Party in the House said that they opposed it for two completely different reasons. One, because um, the 
Congressional People's Caucus, um, no, Congressional Progressive Caucus, there we go, said that it um, invested too much in the military at the expense of the other side of the budget. And then the Blue Dog Democrat side um, thought that it didn't increase defense spending enough. Um, so the party leadership decided not to have a vote when they were originally planning on having a vote. And so the only budget we have with any particulars to work off of is President Trump's 2020 proposed budget. And in the House, there will not be any votes until April 29th. Um, and that means right now, while members of Congress are on their spring recess, they are in listening mode. Every member of Congress is out in their communities doing the rounds, meeting with donors, meeting with constituents, going to libraries, kissing babies, shaking hands <laughs> with people, and they are at their um, strategic information gathering period in every spring. And that's a really critical moment to reach out to them because they are thinking about how they want to respond, respond to the president's budget, how they want to respond to the um, what's it called party leadership budget, and what their personal priorities are and what they want to fight for going into budget negotiations that will inevitably last the rest of the year. Um, and at a minimum, there won't be any votes in the House until April 29th, although there might not wind up being any votes on this um, set of spending caps proposition, proposal, um, but we'll see. Mm, oh, so specifically the House bill proposed increasing defense spending to $666 billion uh, in 2020 and only increasing the non-defense spending half of the budget, which is really um, does a disservice to all the good work, I think, that's done with that side of the budget because it's really much more than half of everybody's priorities. Um, to $631 billion, so significantly less than the defense side. Okay, so this is a brief look at President Trump's 2020 budget. The overall takeaway is increases to Pentagon spending cuts to everything else. I don't know if you can read this from here, but these are some um, examples of specific departments and programs within the federal budget and what Trump's proposed budget would do compared to their current funding levels. So. His budget proposes cutting the Environmental Protection Agency by 31%, increasing the defense budget by 5%, increasing Homeland Security by 7%. And then here are some specific examples about what would these proposed increases to defense spending actually go to fund. Um, well, first of all, as a top line number, it adds $33 billion directly to the Department of Defense over what they received in actual dollars this year. And that brings the total Department of Defense space budget to $718, or 57% of the proposed federal discretionary budget. Those increases would go to creating a US Space Force, investing in hypersonic weapons to shoot under water? Uh, no. That's <laughs> bad. Hypersonic. Uh, oh, are those the deafening sound? ones? Yeah. Thank you. Anyway. Sci-fi stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, artificial intelligence, um, autonomous weaponry, so weapons that can kill people without a human even being on the other side to navigate it and press the kill switch, um, and continuing to build, maintain, and modernize our nuclear arsenal, which is already enough to blow up the world at least a couple times over. And it adds in money allocated, oh, adding in money that's allocated to the National Nuclear Security Administration brings the total defense budget up to $750 billion. <laughs> now I say adding it in because technically that's part of the energy budget, um, energy and environment, but it's clearly intended for making war. So um, that brings the increase to a 34% increase. Okay. And then here are some examples of what the 2020 Trump budget would cut. So within the education department, um, which would see a cut of almost $9 billion, he proposes reducing federal student loan programs by a total of $207 billion over the next 10 years, including eliminating the public service loan forgiveness program and completely ending subsidized student loans. I had a subsidized student loan and I was from a fairly stable, middle-class family, so I can't even imagine how anyone else 
uh, is going to go to college without subsidized student loans. Um, Department of Health and Human Services would see a cut of almost $13 billion. And these little squares, I don't know if you can see them, uh, indicate the total budget. So you can see exactly how much of that budget is cutting off. It's not that much money compared to the $700 billion and more that we talk about in the defense, but compared to the total budget of that department, it's really a significant amount of money. Um, within DHS, his budget proposes cutting National Institute of Health funding by about 12%, and cutting Center for Disease Control funding by about 10%. Um, it also would convert Medicaid into a series of finite block grants, whereas it's currently, as I said, a, a mandatory program and has to grow to meet the need. Um, and it eliminates the expansion of Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. Within the State Department, it would slash foreign aid and diplomacy funding by 23%. As you can see, it already doesn't receive that much money compared to the Department of Defense, which is two different strategies for resolving conflicts on the international stage and it really shows where our priorities as a country are right now. Wait, that's not actually what I mean. I think that our priorities as a country um, made up of individual people, it doesn't reflect their priorities, but it reflects how Congress has um, spent money over the last long time. And then the Department of Housing and Urban Development um, would cuts to the community will completely eliminate the community development block grant program which is a program that gives money to states or excuse me cities to help them invest in uh, different community building things like uh, delivering meals to homebound seniors and it would eliminate the program that funds much needed repairs for public housing entirely eliminated even though um, there's like a documented backlog of repairs needed at public housing across the country. All right, um, so here is exactly what President's 2020 budget would do to the Overseas Contingency Operations Fund. So again, this is the um, fund that was created specifically to fund the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, in 2019, there was $69 billion given to the Overseas Contingency Operations Fund, and Trump proposes giving it $165 billion in 2020, so $100 billion more dollars. And while his budget statement is a request, um, this does reflect where the party is going to try to go in these negotiations. And so from my perspective as a citizen lobbyist, this is exactly the type of thing I want to be pushing back against and um, telling my members of Congress, you know, this might be what the president wants to do, but it's not what everybody in your community wants to do. It's not what all your constituents think is right. Um, and I think it's a provocative question about how can we change this to better reflect individual people's and us as a community's values. <laughs> um, here are a couple implications of proposed nuclear investments. So the administration plans to develop two whole new additional low yield nuclear weapons um, and two conventional versions, ground launched missiles. And uh, both of those additions would actually violate terms of a 1987 treaty we're a part of. So not only would, in my opinion, that be a waste of a lot of money, it also puts us in a contentious place with the rest of the international community. Um, a Congressional Budget Office report in February estimated that the United States will spend almost $500 billion on nuclear weapons from fiscal years 2019 through 2028, compared to the estimate that they published just two years ago in January 2017, that's an increase of almost $100 billion, 23%, when they estimated that it will cost us $400 billion over the next 10 years. Um, so if you go to National Priorities uh, Project's website, as I mentioned earlier, I think, you can get a tax receipt that tells you exactly where all your income tax dollars went in the previous year. You can also look at an average Mainers tax receipt if you don't want to put it, excuse me, don't want to put in how much um, money you paid the previous year. Now this is probably too small for you to see, but just, in, as, just as an example, us in Maine, we spent um, over the course of the year on average uh, about $1,152.35 directly to military contractors. So they did an analysis where they went 
into how the DOT budget was broken out last year and um, really most of the money goes directly to contractors. It doesn't even go to military personnel. That's compared to $461.66 that went to military personnel and that's in the form of pay, benefits, subsidized housing. Um, and they were able to break it out as far as specific uh, contractors. So Lockheed Martin, $152.49. And then conversely, they looked at um, specific pieces of funding in other agencies. So for example, within Housing and Community, um, we gave $82.32 towards disaster relief, $19.87 for homeless assistance grants, $6.50 for public housing, um, $145.38 for college financial aid. So we actually gave more money directly to Lockheed Martin than uh, total con college financial aid last year. Uh, $14.88 for managing wildfires, $5.45 to renewable energy and energy efficiency, $81.46 for the State Department. So, um, these, I guess, will be conversation questions for later. What are your own priorities, and where would you like to see our country investing money? <laughs> Here are a couple blurbs about how programs to support our neighbors are already underfunded, which I probably don't need to be telling any of you, but just as an example, the Pell Grant program, which helps low and moderate income students pay for college, um, did receive modest increases, increases in 2018 and 2019 because of the um, budget negotiations that happened where they um, put in specific attachments to increase a particular, a couple of different programs. However, the maximum Pell Grant in 2019 covered just 28% of the cost of an in-state public four-year degree. Whereas in 1975, the average, or the, excuse me, the maximum Pell Grant uh, covered 79% of that cost. So the assistance that we designed is no longer going as far and it's not funded in proportion to the need by any means. Only one in six low-income children eligible for child care assistance receive it. One in four eligible low-income households receive rental assistance. Um, this is a poll from the um, Peace Perceptions poll, which they do every year, and it asks what people think would be most effective in creating long-term peace. And the little orange thing is where it says, use military to address violence. So, um, and it's, it's broken out by country. So around the entire world, most people think that using the military is only one strategy we should be investing in. But this breakdown of effectiveness on average in each country, perceived effectiveness, comes nowhere near how we're spending our money in the US. Um, these are some interesting quotes from members of the Trump administration in response to um, push back on the 2020 budget. Um, so Russell Vault, Vault, acting director of the Office of Management and Budget, um, said that this is not, quote, this is not funding for endless wars. This is for research and development and procurement to fund the most awe-inspiring military the world has ever known. We can no longer afford the paradigm that Congress keeps giving us, which is that we're never going to make any trade-offs. We are saying, trying to say that we need to continue to secure the country, we need to continue to secure the border, we're not going to be bashful about that. And then the um, Health and Human Services Secretary responded, this budget will help deliver on the President's vision for a fiscally sustainable federal budget, a stronger economy, and a healthier America. So they're making these statements despite the drastic cuts proposed to all types of investments in our countries. And I think it really begs the question of what actually makes us a safer, more secure, healthier country. So most important takeaway to this hour that I've talked at you all is that what members here right now will impact what 2020 funding actually looks like. I expect all of you walked in here knowing roughly the contours of how our federal money is spent. Um, but maybe what you didn't know is that a phone call, even a voicemail, actually makes a really big difference. So I took this quote directly from an article um, that was kind of based around research done um, by a University of Maryland professor, Chris Miller, 
who wrote a book called Constituency Representation in Congress. And she spends her days uh, analyzing uh, the ways legislators understand and respond to their constituents and what actually influences them. And she said, above tweeting, above emails, um, above virtually anything else you can do, she didn't talk, at least in this article, about direct in-person visits to an office. So I would expect that to have at least as much of an impact as a phone call, but who knows. Um, but she said the most important thing you could do is call. And even if you're just leaving a voicemail, because while they're just tallying the number of voices that they hear in different opinions, they use that to gauge where is their district at? What are the priorities of their district? How do their constituents feel? And knowing that someone took the time to make a phone call, even for just 60 seconds, goes a lot further than an email send or a click or a signature to a poll. This brings us to um, what I had originally proposed as a opportunity to basically phone bank and encourage everyone, if they were interested in calling their offices, you should know that the offices are already closed, so you don't have to speak to a human if that is something that is in any way uh, intimidating to you. But your voicemail counts just as much as a call during the day does. And so I designed a call script that is very simple and straightforward around basically, hi, this is my name. When you're leaving a voicemail or whenever you call, you really want to remember to give your address because if you don't, they won't count your call as one from a constituent. They'll just write you off which is disappointing to hear, but I guess it makes sense if they expect people are calling every single office, although I don't know who actually has time for that. Um, and um, uh, two simple sentences, I'm calling to express my concerns, uh, and then a proposed optional, I specifically oppose, or personally, I would rather my tax scholars go to support, whatever, whatever. And then ending the voicemail with just thank you for your time and attention. And I have phone numbers of different offices for all four um, elected members of Congress from the state of Maine. And I will end for now and move into questions if there are any um, after this repeated thank you to Peace Action Maine, um, especially Morgana since you missed the beginning. Thank you for helping make today possible and stand for securing us this room. And if anyone is interested in doing a deeper dive into any of the numbers or ways of looking at the budget. These are some really good resources. Um, Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, Institute for Policy Studies, National Pol Priorities Project are all um, analysis groups and think, ta think tanks based out of Washington, D.C. that really pride themselves on their methodology and whose research I would recommend. And then the Congressional Budget Office is part of the federal government and they're the ones who um, have to report out regularly on the impact of budgets and also like how much money was spent in each year. Um, and the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute looks at international military spending, investment in peace, and a broad variety of issues. Um, and I recommend their work as well. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>